My father was an accountant. And so I was taught at an early age to save. I didn't, wasn't really interested in it, but I was taught to save nonetheless. I remember in my 20s, when I was just getting out of college, when I was starting my life together with Andrea, when the future was ahead of us, I remember I began to see a pattern forming in my life. And here's the pattern. You may, you may relate to it. I would save 500 bucks in the bank, or I'd save $2,000 in the bank. And I would say, wow, look at what I've... And as soon as I had it saved, something would come up. The engine would blow in my car. The roof needed fixing. An unexpected debt that I had, that the payment was due. I don't know what happened, but as soon as I would save the money, something would come up and I would have to spend it. Anybody with me on that or is it just me? I've seen a lot of good body language today. And I remember being incredibly frustrated with God when I was about 24, 25 years old. I was really mad with God. And finally I said, God... Why am I going through all the trouble to save this money if you keep sending me problems? Why in the world am I going through all this stuff if it all just goes right out at the same time? And I know it sounds crazy, but God spoke to me. I didn't audibly hear his voice, but he spoke to my heart. And he said, I sent you the resources because I knew the problems were on the way. I sent you the resources and I sent you the wisdom to save up and to plan and prepare and not waste your time. And so when the problems are coming, you've got the resources to take care of. Oh, the point is, look what the Lord can do when his people are committed to him. That's what we're looking for. God doesn't care about your money. He cares about your heart. And so I'm so grateful that you're here today to kind of hear part number two on how to develop a generous heart. Whether you're young, old, in between, however you consider your life, wherever stage you are, how can I be a generous person? What does it mean to have a heart similar to the heart of God and to be generous? So 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 through 8, because of time today, I want you to just sit there and I want you to listen to these three verses again. It says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. God wants to liberate you and I in this room to live lives of impact. Not just to go about and live our lives and do our thing and be just like everyone else. God desires that we would abound in every good work. And the only way to do that is to give God our commitments. He desires for you and I to be cheerful givers according to this word. It's very, very clear. He makes this point in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, that the benefits that I receive from God are made possible not by how much I give, but by the attitude and commitment by which I give them. That's why he says in verse 7, once again, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God never calls us to give out of pressure or manipulation. This verse says that his love overflows not to the person who gives the most, but to the person who gives with the greatest joy. Now last week, we saw some steps on how to give from a generous heart. If you're filling out those blanks, the first one was remember that it all comes from God. Remember that everything comes from God. That's where our commitment begins. Remember it all comes from from God. It's not about how much I can make, I can do, I can accumulate, but we must remember that everything that we have ultimately comes from God. He's the source of everything that we have. Psalm 50 verses 10 through 11 said the following, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. That's where our commitment begins, understanding the source of where everything comes from. Now, the second point that we made last week was something that probably was um, unexpected from you. Unexpected, we're talking about, hey, let's talk about God. Let's talk about our time. Let's talk about all these other things. But right in the middle of that was a call to integrity from everybody in this room saying the second part of here is commit to work hard 
with integrity. We talked last week, studies estimate that you will spend 35% of your life working. 35% of your entire life you'll spend working. The point is this. Do you think God wastes his time? Do you think God on an average day, on an average, you know, century, on an average, do you think God ever wastes everything that you even know about God? Do you think God wastes his time, yes or no? I don't think so. So why would he create you? Why would he place you on this planet and say, hey, 35% of your entire life, just do whatever you want. Just live however you want. Make money however you want. Work however you want. It doesn't matter what your testimony is at work. As long as you come to church, wear nice clothes, and put a smile on your faith. God will never do that. And so the second point is incredibly important because as you work, how you approach your work, your testimony on your job. I asked the question last week, whether it was school or work, would anyone be surprised if they knew that you were a Christian? That's a pretty big deal. God, I believe, calls us. Once we understand that he's the owner, creator of everything, when we work, we ought to work hard with integrity. I ought to have the same testimony on the job as I have in my home, in my neighborhood, at church. I ought to work hard with integrity thanking God for the work that I do. Number three, we talked about it last week. This one was expected. Honor God first with your finances. Now we call that tithing or giving God the first 10% of our income. And we looked at two points from last week and we're going to add to those this week. But the main thing was honor God first. Now, those of you who've studied the Bible uh, over the years, you'll probably know that the New Testament doesn't talk a lot about tithing. There are loads and loads of scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about tithing, very little in the New Testament. So the question becomes for a lot of people, why do we even need to talk about it? That's just kind of an Old Testament thing, right? Well, to be honest, the New Testament thing was basically selling everything you have and giving it to God. It wasn't just about 10%. It was everything. If you read Acts, the, the epistles uh, in the early church, they gave it all. They didn't just give 10%. They gave everything. So if you don't want to talk about tithing, then as Christians and believers, we need to talk about giving everything to the Lord. Anybody ready to sell your cars, your houses right now? Probably not. So let's go back to the tithing part, okay? <laughs> We talked about two aspects, two important aspects of tithing. The first one was the promise of tithing, that God will bring honor to your pursuits when you first honor him. The promise of tithing. There are so many promises connected with tithing, especially in the Old Testament. God will do this. He will provide this. He will open up this. If you will just honor him, that is a promise that we get from tithing. The second thing that we mentioned last week is the purpose of tithing. God doesn't need your money. The money that you gave today, God is not, not going to go buy a combo number three at McDonald's. God doesn't need your money, but he deserves your trust. And tithing models one of the basic principles of Scripture. Whatever you want God to bless, put him first in that area. Whatever you want God to bless, put him first in that area. Now, normally we get that backwards. Normally, we do things our own way, and then we ask God to bless it afterwards. But whatever you want God to bless, your school life, your friends, your marriage, your children, your job, whatever you want God to bless, put him first in that, trust him in that, and then wait for the blessings to come as you work hard with integrity. That is the purpose of tithing. Now, here's the new part that we didn't get to last week. The third aspect of tithing that's important is the place of tithing. The place of tithing. God intends for us to tithe first to the local church. There's so many um, worthy things out there that we can give our money and our time to. And I don't want to um, downplay any of those, but God intends our tithe first to go to the local church. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 says the following, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and therefore put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. We talked about the purpose of tithing being, we want, whatever we want God to bless, we put him first in our lives. Part of tithing to the local church 
and kind of an undesignated tithing. Now, I'm going to tithe to feed the kids in Guatemala, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do this. When you tithe to a local church, what you're doing is you're saying, God, I trust you enough that the leadership of whatever local church that I'm a part of is going to do the very best that they can with the finances that I've just given. That is a part of trust. That is a part of trusting in, the, in God and trusting in the local church. And when we designate every single thing to, our, to whatever we just want to do, we take out a part of that trust. So the promise of tithing, the purpose of tithing, the place of tithing, God's storehouse is the church where his promises can be put to the test. And then number four, because we've got a lot to talk about today, number four is the plan of tithing. The plan of tithing. God calls us to regularly and intentionally plan how we give money to the church. You should never be surprised that a plate passes by you in any given Sunday morning. That shouldn't be a surprise to you. That ought to be something you anticipate and you've planned for. 1 Corinthians 16.2 says the following. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there may be no collecting when I come. Paul was saying, listen, I don't want to come and beg for money. I want you guys to already have been regularly planning your tithe all along the way so I don't have to come and go, hey guys, hey, you know, it's time. You need to get pony up. No, no, no. He's saying regularly plan. Be very diligent and plan how you tithe. God says that we should put aside or plan to tithe every time we are paid whether it's weekly or monthly. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm not. I'm getting better more and more, but I'm not what I would call a really, really disciplined person with my entire finances. There are certain things that I'm very disciplined about, but overall, I'm not. The reason I give online and I give online with our church is because I know I'm not going to go, oh, dang, where's my wallet? Or I don't have my checkbook. Or what am I going to do? No, no. I know that every time I've already scheduled it, it's going out, and I sit here on that pew and I go, thank you, God, I was able to give to you today. And I don't have any excuse for it because I planned for it ahead of time. So whether you do that online or you do that physically in the church, in the plate, every single week or month, you ought to do that. You ought to plan tithing because the scriptures call us to do it. Now the next one, you guys are going to think I'm meddling, okay? Um, you need to get your feet and you need to put them under your pews so I don't step on them today. The fourth one, and it's a really important point today, is to save money wisely. Save money wisely. Here's what Proverbs 21, 20 says. It says, the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Ecclesiastes 11.2, you've got it on your sheets there as well. Ecclesiastes 11.2 says, give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on the earth. The scriptures not only teach us to tithe, but they also teach us to save. This is a biblical principle. This is not just something good to do. This is a biblical principle to save. The Bible warns us not to waste our resources. It also teaches to save and invest in various ways. Ecclesiastes says give a portion to seven or eight, etc. It's talking about investing in various ways, not knowing what disasters may come. My father was an accountant. And so... I was taught at an early age to save. I didn't, wasn't really interested in it, but I was taught to save nonetheless. I remember in my 20s, when I was just getting out of college, when I started my life together with Andrea, when the future was ahead of us, I remember I began to see a pattern forming in my life. And here's the pattern. You may, you may relate to it. I would save 500 bucks in the bank, or I'd save $2,000 in the bank. And I would say, wow, look at what I've... And as soon as I had it saved, something would come up. The engine would blow in my car. The roof needed fixing. An unexpected debt that I had, the, the payment was due. I don't know what happened, but as soon as I would save the money, something would come up and I would have to spend it. Anybody with me on that or is it just me? I've seen a lot of good body language today. And I remember being incredibly frustrated with God when I was about 24, 25 years old. I was really mad with God. And finally I said, God... Why am I going through all the trouble to save this money if you keep sending me problems? Why in the world am I going through all this stuff if it all just goes right out at the same time? And 
I know it sounds crazy, but God spoke to me. I didn't audibly hear his voice, but he spoke to my heart. And he said, I sent you the resources because I knew the problems were on the way. I sent you the resources and I sent you the wisdom to save up and to plan and prepare and not waste your time. And so when the problems are coming, you've got the resources to take care of. That's the difference. I was so humbled when he told me that, by the way. I was like, ah. Many of us are one disaster away from being in financial crisis because we're more focused on spending than saving. We value our worth. We value how good we're doing by how much we can buy and own rather than how much we can save. Let me ask it this way. Tomorrow, if tomorrow, if tomorrow you went to your mailbox and there was an unexpected check for $5,000 there. I don't know what it was from. Some rebate, some government deal, I don't know. But you've got $5,000 in the bank or, or on, on your hands right there that you didn't expect before. Would your first instinct be to buy stuff or to save it? What would it be? Are you already thinking of the things you would use? New stuff, new TV, remodel kitchen. What, are, are you thinking in terms of what you can use to spend that money or to save your money? Now, ask yourself, why you think that way. See guys, here's the deal. Most of us in this room are Christians. We're saved. We know we've got a place in heaven. Most of us have allowed God to save our hearts to the extent that we're growing and we're discipled, but many of us have not allowed God to penetrate our financial lives. And so we're still making decisions based on our lives before Christ, even though we're Christians and we're saved and we know where we're going in the future. And if you don't think it's cultural, or if you don't think it's your background or other things, listen to this. The average Japanese person living in Japan, the average Japanese saves 25% of their income every single year. Japan is one of the few countries in the entire world in which credit card use is on the decline rather than on the incline. The average European saves 15% of their income each year. When you travel worldwide and you always see Europe, I was like, why are there so many Europeans traveling all the time? It's because they save their money and then they do stuff with it. The average European saves 15% of their income each year. Last year, the average person living in America spent 1% more than they made. The average person living in America spent 1% more than they made. And guys, our financial decisions are crippling us. They're crippling the family. They're crippling our ability to honor God, to save, to provide for our futures, to, to provide for disaster or crisis. It is crippling us. I want to I introduce a principle to you. I know this is going to sound kind of weird, but I want to in introduce a principle to you called... 10, 10, 80. Many of you financial guys know about this. John D. Rockefeller was one of the richest men that ever lived in America. He, in his generation, he was the Bill Gates. He was probably the first Bill Gates in America. And when asked how he grew his wealth, he quoted the 10, 10, 80 principle that people still use today. The principle says the following. I'm going to give the first 10% of my income to God. The second 10% I'm going to save. And I'm going to live on the rest of the 80%. And while a lot of people have tweaked that over the years or done other nuances of that, that is still a basic principle, a spiritual principle that you can take to the bank, literally. Think about how your life would be different right now if you lived under that principle. Think about if you had saved for the last 15 years, those of you who are a little bit, if you had literally saved 10% of your income and never touched it for the last 10 or 20 years what you would have at your disposal right now to use for the kingdom of God, to use for crisis, to use for other things. If you had taken the time to be diligent just about this one principle, think about your level of commitment and depth of worship through faithfully giving 10% or more to God. Practically, 
The, the statistics say that practically you should always save that 10% before paying off your bills. Now, that's, that's a hard thing to do. But the bottom line is, if you wait to save until all your bills are paid all the time, guess what? You'll never, ever save anything. The principles say, give 10% to the Lord. Make that trust in Him. The other 10, put in the bank and begin to save it or invest it in ways that will provide for your future. And then try to live on the other 80%. Now, if you're living beyond your means, if you're in serious debt today, and many of us are, you may have to work a gradual plan up to 10, 10, 8. You can't do that overnight. Okay? But God will give you opportunities. He will give you opportunities to give, save, and pay the bills if you will put your trust in Him first. And if you don't think there are spiritual things connected and tied to this 10, 10, 80 principle, it is huge, guys. This is a spiritual matter. This is not just about being wise about your finances. It's about being liberated to honor God with every part of your life, including your finances. Really, really important to talk about today. The next one on your sheet is plan your spending and avoid debt. Once again, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says the following. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. According to the scripture, our financial decisions to give and invest should never be done under compulsion or pressure. This not only applies to how we give to the church, but it also ought to be applied on how we spend. We should never spend in an emotional manner or a pressured manner. Because oftentimes we fall into serious difficulties or debt. The modern family, once again, is being killed by debt because we are making our financial decisions based on emotions rather than wisdom. Studies from NASDAQ reveal the following. The total consumer debt in America has surpassed $1.3 trillion. The average household, the average family is carrying credit card debt of at least $5,000 or more every single month. Now, there are... There's a psychology behind how we use credit that's really, really interesting. Experimental research also suggests that credit cards really stimulate overspending because what happens is you divorce what you're spending on with the pain of paying for it at the same time. That means if I go out to dinner with my wife, for example, and we go to a really, really nice restaurant, and man, we're paying, we're paying a lot for that, and when I put cash down or I put my uh, ATM card down and I'm paying for that at that moment, I'm associated the pain with, with having to pay for that with the joy of what we've just experienced. But when I divorce those two things and we're just plastic, 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 what happens is I am separating the emotion, the emotion of the joy of what I was doing with the pain of having to pay for it. And studies time after time show that you will tend to spend more almost consistently when you're using credit than when you're using uh, cash or debit card. That's what is going on with so many of us. And this is why this not only happens with us, but we're unfortunately, we have a lot of teenagers here today, and my son is one of them. We're training our, our, our teenagers uh, poorly as well because we want to give them responsibility, so we just throw some money at them. And then they spend it however they want to. How many of you guys in this room, as adults, get a paycheck and you have absolute control over all your money and you spend it on whatever you want to all the time? How many? That's not adulting. You got that. And so we are training our, our young people to do the same thing. Now, uh, we have chores. We have family chores in the house. If you were part of our household, if you ever come and live with us, you got work to do, okay? Everybody in our household has work to do, and that's not work we pay you for. That is just work. Our teenagers are getting very nervous over here because their other parents are hearing this. But every, yeah, you are going to work if you were in our household. Now, there are extra stuff beyond what your typical responsibilities are. As our children have gotten older, we've given them extra responsibilities, and we have begun to pay them for those extra responsibilities. But for every time we pay them, we expect two things out of that payment. Number one, they have to save some of it. And number two, they have to tie. We believe in training our kids from this high up to be able to spend wisely, to, be, to honor God with a tithe, 
and to save because this is a spiritual discipline that we want to train our kiddos to do. And it's amazing, I'm going to prove it, I didn't ask if I was going to talk about it today. It's amazing how his fashion choices changes when he has to pay for the stuff, right? He'll go, damn, man, this is, look at these shoes. These shoes are amazing shoes. And I'm like, great, you want to pay for them? I don't like them that much, you know. I, it changes as you have to invest your own money and stuff. And I want my kids, I want our kids in this church to be able to grow up with that level of spiritual responsibility. Now, we get into debt for many reasons, but debt is a symptom of a lack of gratitude for what God has supplied us. Once again, I mentioned earlier that the lack of tithing reveals my lack of trust in God. Debt reveals my lack of gratitude for God's provision. God, I know you provided X amount of dollars, but I really need more. I want more, and so I'm going to go into debt in order to get it. It is a lack of gratitude. My debt says I need more because God has not provided me enough. Let me ask a question to you today. How many of you enjoy the ministries of our church? Hmm? I mean, enjoy, I mean, most of you would say, hey, I enjoy being here. I like being here. I like my friends. I like the atmosphere. I like everything that we're doing here. Obviously, it's all due to God. But let me tell you, there were some decisions that my wife and I made 25 years ago that have an impact of what we're doing right here and right now. About 25 years ago, I, I guess, well, yeah, yeah, I guess that would be right. My wife and I were looking at getting our first home, and we were really excited about it. We'd never bought a home before. We were scared to death, but we uh, were excited about it. And almost every friend, every couple that we had, we were all in those couple things together, and we were all, we're about to have babies, and we're going we're gonna to have houses, we're going to be really real adults and go out and do all these things. And almost every friend that we had was buying a house two or three times the size that they really needed. And getting into serious mortgage and debt payments, even though they could, they could technically make those payments, it left no room for decisions. It left no room for saving. It left no room for anything else. Almost everything was going into these new homes that they felt like they had to buy. After Andrew and I prayed and prayed about it, we decided to buy the, pretty much the humblest house that we could find at the time in Lexington. Now, what we, you know, it was it was still nice, but in the neighborhood, it was the lowest price house that we could find in that same neighborhood. And what happened is we didn't know it at the time, but two years down the road, as we saved, as we, as we tried to honor God with our finances, two years down the road, God placed a call on our lives to be missionaries in Guatemala. And if we had been in deep, deep debt, the way most of our other friends were, we could have never made the decision to pack it all up and to be missionaries in another country. Which led me to pretty much learn a, a language, but also learn a culture to be able to come back here today and to pastor a multiracial bilingual church that we have today. If you don't think that your financial decisions have any impact on the kingdom of God, you're fooling yourselves. God wants to liberate you to be able to give, to save, to provide, to do all these things, to make the decisions when God makes the call that I will go and I have nothing holding me back. That is what God wants out of each and every one of us. This is not about giving money to the church. This is about liberating your life to glorify God. That's what this is about. Proverbs 21.5 says the following, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Now let, let me just say one thing before we close today. I don't even know what time it is. One thing before we close today. Being poor is not a sin. Being poor is not a sin. But being wasteful with whatever we have is sinful. If you don't know where tomorrow's meal is coming from, if, if next week you're just not sure even how to pay, the, it is not a sin to be poor. Jesus said the poor you'll have with you always. It is not sinful to be poor, but it is sinful to misuse the resources that God has given us. God gives dignity to all people, rich or poor. And once again, it's not about how much you can give. It's about giving with a cheerful heart. Final, finally on your sheet today. Commit your plans to God. Started with God today, we ended with God today. 
It started with understanding that God is the owner and creator of everything. That's where this journey begins. And it ends by saying, God, okay, I understand I need to make some changes. I want to take some steps in order to be generous, in order to liberate my life. Now, whatever you plan to do, commit it to the Lord. It begins and ends with a commitment. 